Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Standard. I'm the uh, founder and CEO here at Petabridge, and today I'm making a video just for fun. We're gonna talk about consistent hash distributions, which is a basic kind of simple mathematical technique for being able to efficiently distribute work and state inside a distributed system. Most of you will probably never have a need to implement this directly in any of your own application code, but a lot of the tools that you depend on, such as most databases, distributed caches, Okka.net, for instance, all use this technique under the covers in order to efficiently find ways to uniquely distribute state over a network. The problem that we're trying to solve with the consistent hashing is all state for a given thing should exist in one consistent location on the network. This is a pretty basic idea, which is that all of the data that relates to a single entity inside my system. So if I'm building a multiplayer game, that entity might be a player or maybe a non-player character or maybe some other type of entity, like uh, maybe an environmental detail. All of the data for that entity should exist in one place. Uh, that's going to give us the ability to keep a consistent view of it. It's also going to give us the ability to allow that entity to react to real-time changes in its state. For instance, when a uh, non-player character's health bar drops to zero, it might die and spawn some loot for a uh, the player character to pick up. So we need to go ahead and try to get all that data co-located in a single location. What makes this problem challenging is the distributed nature of it, where you have multiple different processes all interacting with each other and they need to potentially retrieve a copy of that object state or they need to be able to send commands that affect the object state and then get events back in return. What this looks like in practice is that the locations where the state can be stored can potentially be added and removed from the network at any given time. So for instance, uh, we might scale up the number of game servers we're using when it's peak hours, and then we might scale them back down again. And that's gonna involve reshuffling where data used to be housed at some point in time. If we're maintaining a distributed cache or distributed database, uh, we might go ahead and scale up and down the number of cache servers or database servers, and that's gonna result in us having to move data around whenever that happens. So then on top of that, as a consequence of, let's say, changing the topology of our network, a location that previously held data for a particular entity uh, might go offline, and therefore we need replication. We might need the ability to have multiple potential locations where an entity can be hosted inside our system, and we need a consistent way of determining where those locations might be. And this brings us to the really painful part of this problem, which is bullet number three. Every single request to send either a command to a stateful entity or a, let's say, a query to go ahead and get its current value or any other type of messaging interaction you might imagine, all of these have to be able to resolve to the correct location on the network very quickly. Uh, we have a couple of, let's say, bad solutions for trying to solve this problem, such as what if we centralized our state storage in a single location? It's like, okay, well, if we don't wanna have a distributed system, maybe we don't do that. Maybe we go ahead and we centralize all of the state in a single database or you know, maybe a, a single process somewhere in our network. Well, the obvious issue here is that that can't scale. Uh, you can't scale a single point of failure or a single point of bottleneck uh, at all. And as a result, uh, once your system becomes large enough where you start hitting the physical limits of what one computer can do, or you just run into any of your sort of pedestrian, you know, network reliability issues that will inevitably occur, uh, you're going to have a problem here. So centralizing state storage in a single location uh, will not work for these types of, let's say, low latency distributed systems type issues. On top of that, uh, the next approach a developer might consider is an ad hoc approach to trying to determine where state's located. So basically, rather than let's say maintaining a consistent system for knowing where a entity state might be stored at any given time, let's go ahead and let it be somewhat self-determining and therefore a little bit random and unpredictable. In which case, every time we need to find state, we're gonna go ahead and have to essentially query the global state of the system uh, and via a scatter gather type messaging interaction and get that picture back. Well, the obvious problem here is that every node queries every other node as part of every request. Therefore, if the number of requests inside your system is anything other than a very small number, uh, this is going to be very chatty, it's gonna be very slow, and it's going to flood the network with a bunch of nonsense traffic. So we need something that's a little bit more predictable and a little bit more systematic. We need some way of being able to determine ahead of time where state might be stored inside the system. And that system also needs to be flexible enough to accommodate scaling up the number of storage locations and scaling them down at some point in the future. 
And this is where consistent hashing enters the picture. So let's talk about the right solution of this problem, which is consistent hash distributions. Consistent hash distributions are a very old technique. They've been used since the 1970s to help solve these types of distributed computing problems. And they allow us to guarantee a mutually exclusive distribution of state, meaning that all data ends up in one place on the network. And then on top of that, they are very, very inexpensive. You can run uh, tens of millions of these calculations per second, no problem. Uh, and then on top of that, if you wanna go ahead and do replication, which is the second factor we discussed, that's actually very easy to do with a consistent hash model as well. So we'll go ahead and start getting into the guts of this. Now, the first couple of prerequisites we would need in order to actually use consistent hashes, the first is that every node on the network that's gonna be responsible for either sending data to stateful entities or hosting them needs to have access to the full network topology. I basically need to know who are all the locations on the network that can store data, and if so, I need to be able to contact them. If you're building something like a multiplayer video game, you likely already have the tools to do this. That's your multiplayer video game wouldn't work without it. But if you're building something a little bit more enterprisey or maybe uh, something that's internal, you might want to consider using a library like Aka.Cluster, for instance. That's uh, one of the libraries we produce here at Petabridge. So it's a C-sharp library. Uh, this gives you the ability to go ahead and form your know, arbitrary networks of .NET processes together using the uh, sort of Aka.NET distributed actor runtime. So you need that network topology first. Second thing that you'll need is that all the nodes that are in your topology need to be sorted in some type of consistent order. Uh, if you don't do this, then the hash graph is gonna look different for every single node, meaning that um, who owns this particular range of data is not gonna be the same on every node. Therefore, that's going to defeat the purpose of trying to use consistent hashing. The solution for this is really simple. We just need to have our address class or wherever we're gonna be storing this node data it needs to implement the iComparable interface. So as long as you go ahead and use something like this, we can go ahead and sort all the nodes in a consistent order. It doesn't necessarily matter like in what order they're sorted in, as long as it is uniform throughout the cluster. That's the important part here. So with those two prerequisites out of the way, let's take a look at consistent hashing functions and what makes them special. So the first thing that makes a hash function consistent is that the same input produces the same output on every node. This typically means that these hash functions don't rely on random number generation. Instead, they tend to use techniques like bit collisions and bit shifting, where a small change in input data should produce a pretty big change in output. And that's something that people who are much more uh, well-versed in cryptography and math would have to be able to explain to you. Uh, I'm just uh, a mere distributed systems developer. I just go ahead and consume their output and trust that it all works. Uh, one thing we will do though, is we're actually gonna go ahead and run some data through a consistent hash function we use inside Aka.net and you're gonna get a chance to see how evenly it gets distributed. So we'll take a look at that a little bit later. The other thing that makes a hash function consistent is that the output size is a fixed range. Uh, so for instance, Murmur 3 might only implement a 32-bit or a 64-bit integer. This means that if I pass in a one byte uh, byte array or maybe a four terabyte byte array, I'm still getting a 32-bit integer at the end. So the output range doesn't scale with input range. The, the output size is fixed. This means that we can essentially plot all the values that might be possibly distributed from this hash, hash function into a, let's say, a, a clock-like structure called a hash ring. And we can distribute that evenly across all the nodes in our network that might be responsible for hosting some of our state. So we're gonna see a diagram of that on the next slide. Now, what are some examples of consistent hash functions in the wild? Well, the MD5 hash function is consistent. That's one you might use. Uh, most developers that are building these types of distributed systems tend to prefer things like Murmur 3. I think there might even be a Murmur 4 algorithm out now. Honestly, I haven't really looked. Uh, but these hash functions tend to get uh, picked more frequently because they tend to be a lot faster than MD5 is. Since speed is a priority, getting a hash function that has those consistent hash uh, properties consistently that produces a nice, uh, fairly large, uh, widespread distribution and executes really quickly is worth a lot in this space. So Murmur 3 is what we use, and that's what we're gonna be kind of focusing on for the rest of this uh, little video. Now, from a consistent hash function point of view, here's what the distribution part of it looks like. Now imagine that this is a 64-bit unsigned long integer. That's the output that we're gonna produce from our Murmur 3 function, for argument's sake. If the lowest possible value is zero, since it's unsigned, the highest possible value would be two to the 64. I don't know what the name of that number is, but it is very large. So what we can do is say, okay, I'm going to start plotting all my values from zero 
And I'm going to go continuously in a circle like this. We're going to go from 0 and I'm going to go all the way back up to 2 to the 64. So all these values will be mapped contiguously in sort of this like clock-like fashion here. Well, if I know that I'm going to have four nodes hosting state inside my system, I can divide up the different range of possible hash values among those four nodes. So each one of these nodes is going to own an equal region of the total, we'll call it the hash space here, the total um, possible range of values this hash function might produce. So node one gets the first uh, pie slice here. So values zero through R, where R is equal to maximum output value divided by you know, the number of nodes. So that'll be one fourth of the range. And then node two will get the next fourth, node three, then node four. And that's generally how it works. So what we would do to essentially distribute state is for every, let's say, um, message we want to send, or if you're using like an RPC system for every method we want to invoke, we would need to have some sort of entity identifier on that message or on that method. That signifies which entity are we trying to locate inside the system. So if our entities are identified with just, let's say, uh, string values, if I go ahead and pass in, you know, Aaron, my name, into this function here, that might resolve to a value that can be found in the first quarter of this hash range. Therefore, we know that my state for this entity, Aaron, is going to be hosted on node number one. So I can go ahead and send that message to node one, and I know that it's going to arrive at the correct location. Likewise, if I go ahead and pass in this sort of like GUID looking value down here, that might resolve a hash code that can be found in node number three. So we're gonna distribute all messages with this value to node three instead. So let's go ahead and take a look at a little demo here and get a sense for how even this distribution might look using a function like murmur three, for instance. All right, so here's a little demo that I've whipped together in a link pad. So, and I've also uh, made the source code for this available on um, a little GitHub gist, and I'll link to that in the show notes. But basically what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start with this entities per node factor. For each one of the quote nodes that we're gonna have in our little fake distributed system, there should be roughly this many entities. And we're gonna actually take a look at a little chart that visualizes this at the very end. Next, we're gonna generate an arbitrary number of host names here. So we're just gonna generate, I think, 10 host names. Uh, they're gonna be sorted in ascending order. So we've, you know, as long as every single node in the cluster also did this, we'd be fine. And then finally, we're gonna keep track of the entity to node allocations here, where each one of these keys corresponds to one of these node values here. And this integer just keeps track of how many entities would be allocated to that node under this arrangement. So then we generate our entity IDs using that scaling factor and the total number of nodes. And we generate a little unique key right here. This is gonna be our hash key. And this is what we're gonna feed as input into our murmur hash function. Murmur hash function is from the Aka.net uh, core library. Uh, it's a very fast uh, sort of string-based uh, hashing system that uses the murmur hash algorithm under the covers. This is the system that we use for distributing entities in real systems, like Akadot cluster sharding, for instance, uses this. In fact, I'm making a video about that right now. So we're going to go ahead and you know grab the string hash right here. Now, this is a potentially signed integer, so it's just a it's not unsigned. So what I'm going to do down here is I'm going to call math.abs in order to get rid of the uh, sign value. And we're going to take the hash code and use a little bit of modulus to determine which one of the nodes on this list does it belong to. And once we've done that, we'll go ahead and get the appropriate node ID. And we will grab that node ID entry in the dictionary, increment it. And then at the very end, we're going to fill out a little pie chart that has the visualization of what each node in the system, um, basically how many entities have been allocated to it. So let me go ahead and run that real quick. And we can see starting from host name zero, going all up to host name nine. So that's all 10 of our entities here. Host name zero has a perfect 10. Host name one has 10. Host name two only has six. Host name three has 12. Host name four is 14, 11, 13, etc. So it's not 100% perfect in terms of maintaining a perfectly even distribution. And one of the factors that affects that, by the way, is that the byte for byte value of these inputs, they're all very closely aligned to each other, meaning that the inputs aren't randomly distributed either. Uh, so as a result of that, the hash code function has to inject a whole bunch of bit shifting to kind of help distribute them pretty evenly. And I think it actually did quite an admirable job here, all things considered. Now, if we dial up the entities per node factor to something larger, the disparities should become a little bit less noticeable as a percentage. So for instance, actually, let me go back to 10 again. 
Let's find one of the nodes that was small. Host name nine only has six under uh, when we were doing just 10 nodes per entity. If we do 100 nodes per entity, now we're at 98. So instead of basically being off by a factor of 40%, now we're off by 2%. So this is kind of a law of large numbers deal. The greater the amount of things you're distributing to a smaller number of entities, the more even the distribution is going to get over time. When the number of things you're distributing is quite small, uh, you might end up with some larger disparities when you do this. But as the number of things you distribute gets larger, uh, those will all eventually even out over time. So yeah, we have 98 on here. Um, and yeah, that's basically kind of the gist of taking a look at what a consistent hash distribution might look like in a real distributed system. Um, we just kind of virtualize it all right here. And as you can see, the math is very, very simple. Uh, the way the actual hash code function works might be a little complex under the covers, but actually using it to both create this type of distribution is not very expensive. So I wanted to go ahead and illustrate that today. We're gonna to take a look at one more thing before we end this video, which is what happens when repartitioning occurs. So let's go ahead and take a look at that in just a second. So the last thing I wanted to take a look at today is repartitioning, which is one of the more, let's say, a difficult production grade problems you might run into uh, when using a tool like distributed uh, consistent hashes. Uh, namely that if I go from having four nodes to having eight, all of a sudden my distribution is gonna look a lot different. Now. I went ahead and basically kind of simulated here that all four of my original nodes would still appear higher on the sort order than the other four that we added. That's probably not how it would shake up in real life, to be honest with you. But for the sake of just making it easy to follow, that's, that's how I drew it. Now, what we would run into here is that every single one of these nodes that was previously a member of our hash distribution has had their hash range cut in half. Therefore, these new nodes that have entered the cluster are now the owners of those entities that used to be on there before. Dealing with this repartitioning problem is a little bit more complex than the original routing solution because now we need to tell half the entities that are on node one that they need to be relocated onto node two or possibly node eight or maybe some other node in the cluster that might have owned part of that range before. And that's what kind of makes this a much more interesting sort of production level challenge. Uh, one of the things I'll be talking about in my next video is Akadot cluster sharding, which was built specifically to solve this problem with consistent hash routing, namely to try to make sure we have some means of being able to easily repartition the hash range uh, in a manner that is uh, safe. So we end up with exactly one copy of every possible entity in the system and maintains that even distribution and that really quick entity resolution that we had before. So I'll stay tuned for that video. Go ahead and make sure you like and subscribe. And thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you.